Um, and, you know, I, I had just gotten back to the city and I was starting to see COVID kind of take over and feeling like, you know, I was seeing my, my dad, who's a doctor, you know, go out and, and, and be risking his life and nurses and public transportation workers and grocery store workers, uh, you know, really risking their lives to help out those most in need. And I felt like, you know, here I am sitting on my butt, you know, watching Netflix. Um, I've got all this time on my frequently washed hands. You know, there's, there's got to be more that I can be doing. And so I didn't know exactly what shape that would take. But then I saw a post on Facebook from a friend of mine, Simone, who went to college with my brother. And um, she was saying, does anybody know of a volunteer service that connects young, energized volunteers with the elderly, the immunocompromised, anybody who's home right now who really shouldn't be going outside? Uh, does anyone know of, an or of a volunteer organization that I could volunteer for uh, to, to deliver them groceries? And people were, were commenting on that post saying, that sounds like a great idea. Let me know if you hear of an organization like that. I'll also volunteer, but I don't know of anything that does that. And so I reached out and I said, you know, what if we made a service like this? And so we threw together a Squarespace website and put, a, put up a, a couple flyers on social media, asked people to spread it around. And within a couple of days, uh, we had several thousand people sign up. It was really a, a beautiful outpouring of support from the community. Our flyers were translated into, I think, 16 different languages. Um, we started getting calls you know, from, from press, but also from local community organizations and senior centers, uh, homeless shelters, places that needed this service, but weren't exactly sure where to go for it. Um, and it really you know, had to move from kind of casual crisis response into sustainable, organized nonprofit incredibly quickly. And that was really when a lot of our volunteers stepped up to you know, serve in the call center because originally the, you know, the flyer originally just had my own personal phone number on it. And then Blake Lively put that phone number on her Instagram and then L.com put it on their website. And then Senator Bernie Sanders decides to email out my phone number to his panelists and says, call this number if you need free food. Doesn't specify New York, just says call this number if you need free food. Um, so my phone was blowing up. So it was very helpful to have a lot of people being able to feel those calls and say, sorry, just serving New York right now. It's, and even that's a bit of a stretch. Um, so it, it, it grew a lot more quickly than I had initially anticipated. But that was also, I think, reflective of the feeling in our community right at that moment that, you know, we're being told that the best thing we can do right now is stay at home. And I get it. Social distancing matters. But at the same time, when you want to be active in your community and you want to do something, to be told stay home is such a non-answer. And so the opportunity to be able to do something productive in my community, serving those in need, recruiting other people and engaging them in this fight for social and, and food and economic justice um, felt critical to me. Um, and, you know, we had a, a doctor reach out, actually, who said, you know, I work 19 hour shifts with COVID patients. I, you know, I always wear PPE and it's kind of scary, but I, I make sure to wash my hands and keep myself safe and I want to volunteer in my free time. How can I help? And I said that how you can help is please go to sleep in those five hours of free time you have during the day. Um, but that doctor wanted to help, you know, and I think it speaks to a larger ethos in our community of wanting to participate in service, of wanting to connect to another person in our community. You know, I've met neighbors through this whom I never would have met if not for this disease, which feels like a really weird thing to say, uh, but it's true. And, you know, one woman I delivered to tried to set me up with her granddaughter after the delivery. So it turned out to be helpful for my dating life as well. Um, and, you know, one woman I, I completed a delivery to, Carol, she, um, you know, I, I dutifully dropped the stuff off at her door and backed away to a distance of six feet. And she came out and she said, come on in, come on, I, I made some cookies and tea. I said, Carol, I, I, I can't. That's the whole point. If I could do that, we, there would be no need for this. And she said, no, 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 it's fine. It's fine. I made some cookies. I said, Carol, no, I, I can't. It's, it's the rules we've set for ourselves. And she said, okay, fine. But, but when you're coming, but when this whole thing is over, you're coming back for some tea and cookies. And I said, okay. And I'm really looking forward to that day when we are able to hang out in, in person and talk to each other in a non-Zoom related capacity. Um, when Carol and I can sit down after months of this crazy pandemic and have a conversation. Um, you know, there was actually a, a woman who reached out recently. She lived in Michigan and her father lived in New York and he lived alone. He had a social worker come by, but once the pandemic started, she stopped coming by and he had been diagnosed with COVID. He was in his eighties. He didn't have any resources that he could turn to and he had no way of getting food. And she was feeling really desperate because at that point, you know, travel was super restricted. She didn't, she wasn't able to get to him. And she heard about us on Good Morning America, and she placed a request for her father and his Invisible Hands volunteer 
would come to his apartment every week and drop off groceries and medicine. And then they would just talk on either side of his door. And, you know, I don't think they ever once met each other in person. I don't think they would recognize each other if they passed on the street. But they became friends. And they would share stories about their lives and their fears and their joys. And in that moment of what must have felt like profound solitude, they were able to find friendship. And he passed away, actually, of COVID. And his daughter wrote to us saying that even though he had died, you know, your help was not in vain. And that this volunteer was able to provide a little bit of solace and a little bit of guidance and a little bit of friendship um, to lend a caring and invisible hand um, to help out in those final days of his life. And so, you know, I was asked recently why people would do this, why they would risk their lives to do it. <laughs> and, you know, as with that doctor, as with that volunteer, I think that we're all feeling a little bit of a calling right now of a feeling of we're in such a state of constant crisis and there has to be more that I can be doing. And the honest answer is there is more you can be doing. And if you have an idea, share it on Facebook. You never know. Like this literally started out as a Facebook post with a flyer with my personal phone number on it. And then, you know, now we have a fully staffed volunteer call center and thousands of volunteers throughout New York and New Jersey and Pennsylvania. And we're expanding to other places as well so that we can help out in communities in need there. Um, if you have the drive and the dedication, there is genuinely nothing stopping you um, except yourself. And specifically with respect to this crisis, I think you can't choose to risk your life these days, right? We're in a state of pandemic where anything you do could be a risk. The only thing you can choose is what you're risking it for. And to a lot of people, I think especially a lot of young people, if I get this disease, I'll, I'll get sick and it could be dangerous, but more likely I'll be okay. But if someone in their 80s goes out and God forbid gets sick, that can be life-threatening. It can be genuinely you know, devastating to them and to their entire support structure, their family. Um, so I think for a lot of people, there's no question. It, it is a, a sense of duty that motivates us to do good. And that sense of drive and ambition and passion for our fellow neighbors, I think is something that is pushing back the, the inequities that we're seeing to an incredible degree. You know, when we first got our, you know, we got our $50 donation and, you know, we started freaking out. We're like, oh my God, what are we going to do with this money? You know, I, I'm a college student that can buy a lot of pizza, you know, who knows what to do with $50. Um, and so we started up a subsidy program where not only would we complete free deliveries, but we would also subsidize the food itself. And so we decided to subsidize up to $30 per family per week um, to help offset some of these deeper economic problems that are arising as a result of COVID, these uh, systemic racial and economic inequities that have been unveiled and exacerbated as a result of this disease. Um, and so we decided to, you know, to start up the subsidy program and pretty much immediately it just took off. The good news was we were able to help a lot of people. The bad news was we were shelling out like six times what we were taking in during a day. Uh, we were getting calls from homeless shelters, you know, saying, can you subsidize basically our you know, entire food budget? And we were a four day old organization. And so we really just did not have the, the, the capacity to help with that. Um, so we had to shut it down. And it was really, really painful for a lot of people who had come to rely on us. Um, and so we've been looking for ways to help out food and secure communities ever since then. And that's taken, you know, uh, a lot of partnerships with food pantries, with mutual aid organizations, with local religious institutions. And I think what you're seeing now is a lot of groups and a lot of people coming together, looking at the problems that have arisen and bringing new ideas. I think one of the best things about this organization, Invisible Hands, is that we arose at a time when there are other organizations, but they all have their own set ways. And it's difficult to, to steer a huge ship in the midst of a global pandemic. And it was nice that we were able to form and kind of adapt to ever-changing circumstances, right? When, when Governor Cuomo announced that glove, uh, when Governor Cuomo announced that we had to wear PPE, right? And that PPE was required. We thought, okay, sure, you know, we'll, we'll tell everyone to wear masks, but how are we going to enforce that? Not everyone might have access to masks. Not everyone might have the financial ability to buy masks and go outside. So we set up what we called glove hubs, which were essentially stations where you could purchase, uh, where, where volunteers would have gloves, masks, and sanitizing equipment for any volunteer who needed it for free. And so in that way, we were able to help 
volunteers get access to these supplies and, and, and lower the barriers to volunteerism. I don't know if a more established organization would have that kind of flexibility and adaptability to navigate these uncertain waters in which we find ourselves. But that, that I think has really made a young organization and young people very effective is we're not bound by the strictures of what is considered possible. What we're doing is making what seemed impossible possible. And so I think that that's been a tremendous gift um, for, that a lot of people have brought to bear during this crisis. And it's all with the same goal, right? No matter who, who you talk to right now, you're, you're seeing people stand up and push back against this tide of inequity to a degree I've never seen before. Um, and so if you look at the news, it sounds scary and it is scary, but you'll also see stories of hope and of perseverance. And I think that to be young these days is to have that resilience already forming, but also to be able to hope. And it is seeing people do some good in a world that feels so bad and pull together at a time when the world is pulling us apart. Because we know that it's only by pulling together that we will pull through. And I fully believe that we will. Um, you know, I was reading the op-ed from that uh, was just published today from John Lewis, where he said, let us answer the highest calling of our hearts and stand up for what we truly believe. And he said to this new generation of leaders, it's our turn to let freedom reign. And that's what you're seeing these days. So it's been a tremendous experience of watching young people take the reins and, and, and really lead. And I couldn't be more honored to be a part of that fight. Great, thank you so much. Um, yeah, thank you. So I think that we have um, a few questions to start. And then again, if um, people have any other questions, they can just, I think they can use the Q&A function um, and then I can read them out loud. So the first question um, is, how does the process actually work? Um, that's a very vague question, but I think, you, yeah. That's yeah, no, it's a great one. Um, it has adapted a lot, um, but so when it originally started, it was again, right, you know, call Liam on his phone and, um, and, and we'll do a group text. So we essentially recruited volunteers in neighborhoods. Um, so, you know, wh what neighborhood are you from? Um, we're just in Manhattan Valley. So if you so we would recruit volunteers from Manhattan Valley, and um, if a request came in in Manhattan Valley, we would text all the volunteers and be like, "Hey, can you take this delivery?" That quickly got out of hand within a couple days because we had again thousands of volunteers. Um, so now we operate in a Slack workspace, um, and so essentially anyone in need of a delivery can submit a request either through our call center, seven three two six three nine one five seven nine, I believe, um, but you might want to fact check me on that, um, and. Uh, or, or through our website, invisiblehandsdeliver.org. And so we make sure to keep our call center open because we know that a lot of people who might want to delivery you know, may not be familiar with websites and technology, so we try to keep our, our call center open for that purpose. Um, you'll submit a request. You'll say, you know, here's what I want. Here's where I live. If you have a store you'd prefer us to order from, you can submit that. Um, and then we will essentially put that request out it, to all the volunteers in your neighborhood. And someone will claim that delivery They'll call you on the phone, confirm your order, engage you in conversation, right? That's another thing we really want to prioritize, as I said, is that sense of communities coming together. Because we talk about social distancing and something that my co-founder Simone always says that I really respect is it's not social distancing, it's physical distancing, but we can and must still be socially engaging with one another. And so your volunteer will call you on the phone, talk to you, engage you in conversation. They'll do your shopping for you and drop it off at your house. Um, they'll you know, sanitize the bag and stuff so that you that wear a mask the whole time, um, you know, obeying all CDC recommended guidelines and, and drop off your supplies. Um, so it's a really easy process um, and we're able to turn around most deliveries within a, a, a pretty short time frame. Thank you. Um, okay, another one um, is, so um, we were just wondering how you get money or financial support. So I heard, I think that you had received a grant from Robinhood. Um, are you looking to make Invisible Hands a more permanent organization? Or, and that's like, this is adding on to that, but so yeah, I guess like financial support and then also like in the future. It's a great question. Um, and I think that, you know, finances are one of the weirdest and toughest things to figure out when you're trying to start a new nonprofit. Um, so yes, we, we, we were lucky to receive a grant from the Robin Hood Foundation and some other organizations, including uh, the New York City Civic Impact Fund, uh, which was run out of the mayor's office. Um, they were very generous to us as well, as well as the Brooklyn Community Foundation. 
Um, so, so it was some foundations, but it was also by and large grassroots. Um, it, organizations like this, especially at the beginning, large foundations and corporations are great, but they often want demonstrated impact. And how are you supposed to demonstrate impact when you don't have the money to make that impact in the first place? It's one of the weirdest cycles of non-funding that I've ever seen. Um, so it, rely, it, it relies a lot on trust within the community that we've tried really hard to build and, and grassroots support and donations. Um, in the future, what was your question? Just how, how do we plan to raise funds or? or yeah, what? that was a bit unclear. Um, I guess just it's a kind of different question, but um, so are you thinking to make invisible hands like more permanent? Um, so just what is the future look like? It's a great question. And I think a lot of us right now are trying to figure out what the, what the future holds. I don't, I mean, I don't even know what I'm having for dinner tonight. So to say what's gonna happen several months down the line is, is tough. This organization is only a couple months old. Um, but I think what I'm seeing these days and what we're seeing in New York more broadly is the food inaccessibility part is huge. And you know, corporate delivery systems are taking a long time to complete deliveries. It's infuriating and, and profoundly scary for people. Similarly, that almost deeper hunger of social isolation is also really harming our community. And so I think there is a real space for us there. But we're also very mindful of not wanting to undercut paid delivery workers, right? We wanna go where the market can't um, and, and serve those who can't. And so in addition to food inaccessibility, I think what you're seeing now is a lot of food insecurity and inaffordability. One in four New Yorkers now goes to bed hungry, is food insecure. And that has a tremendously destabilizing impact on our communities in multiple respects, whether it be economic or social. Um, and so I kind of see invisible hands in the future expanding in two ways. First, I see our geographical scope expanding to go to other areas that are being really profoundly impacted by COVID-19 right now. Uh, but I also see us going deeper. So I think there's a breadth and a depth. We, and so we're, again, starting to address some of these deeper problems of food insecurity that I think will be around long after this disease is over. You know, even once we have a vaccine and it's widely distributed, um, once this disease ebbs, the inequities and inequalities left in its wake will pervade for quite some time. Um, and so we're focused on addressing that through partnerships with food pantries, mutual aid orgs, religious institutions, and trying to, to you know, find out if there are ways that we could bring back a more limited subsidy program to, to try and help out these communities that are really struggling right now. Thank you. Um, okay, so one from the chat is, um, did you have any experience running an organization before? If not, what experience have you drawn in figuring out how to run Invisible Hands? It's a phenomenal question. Um, the short answer is no, um, which was a little bit of why this was such a weird thing. And I think if I had been not in the midst of a pandemic and feeling like there has to be something I can do, let me find something I can do, um, I might not have started it because I would have thought, whoa, what am I thinking? Um, I did not intend for this to be a, a nonprofit, right? I intended this to be a cute little thing and I would you know, help out Ethel and Gladys with their deliveries in my building. Um, and it expanded into something really quickly. And so I did have to you know, adjust my frame of mind. Um, I have some experience in community organizing, uh, largely through voter engagement and political action um, throughout college and high school, um, you know, running uh, school organizations, but nothing on this scale, certainly nothing with thousands of people. I'd run stuff, you know, on the scale of hundreds um, in high school and college. Um, so I suppose in some ways I had some organizing experience, but a lot of it came from the understanding that I didn't have that experience necessarily and a willingness to learn from those who did. So because this thing took off so quickly, we were able to get in contact with a lot of nonprofit executives, um, people who had run similar you know, Meals on Wheels, those kinds of organizations and learn from them. Say, hey, what worked for you? What didn't? What spaces aren't you able to fill that we might be? And learning from them and then also saying, okay, now we may not have experience in the nonprofit sector, but guess what? We have like 80, people in our volunteer list who do. We have 80 doctors with experience in the medical field. Let's bring all these people together. Let's have conversations about what solutions might work. And then ultimately, let's pick a direction and go with it and, and throw some things at the wall and see what works. And we've gotten really lucky that most of those things have worked, but it's always a constant conversation of how can we improve. And I think that the, the first step has to do with experience, which I had some of, um, and the second step has to do with listening. Listening to those who do, and listening to those who, who on, in whose footsteps you walk. You know, we, we all stand on the shoulders of giants. Um, and so it's our job to, to bring us a little bit closer to that mountaintop. 
Um, and then the third step is to pick a, pick a direction and do it with all the experience and information from other people that you can, and then run full steam at the wall and, and, and hope, for, hope for the best. Thank you. Um, okay, the next one is kind of adding on to what you were just talking about, but um, were there some interesting mistakes or things that you would have done differently looking back on the beginning process? Uh, are there any mistakes that we didn't make? Um, yeah, absolutely. Um, I think one thing that I've really learned is the importance of community building, especially right now. That when I started this, I thought, you know, okay, people will go and make their deliveries and that'll be awesome. And what you see, I think, both in political campaigns and in community service organizations, is people come for the mission, but they stay for the people and they stay for the community. And so one thing that has been really helpful that I think we may have undervalued at first, but I think that we are seeing uh, the, the real power of and impact of, is just a simple connection. It's the notion that even you and me sitting in our own apartments, you know, miles away from each other, we're not alone. We have each other, we have the people on this call, we have literally, as I've seen, thousands if not millions of people out there who want to be your friend, who want to be your ally, who want to stand by your side and help you out. And all you have to do is reach out. So to me, that's the biggest lesson I've learned is the importance of people and, and leveraging that people power to accomplish a, an end that's bigger than any of us. Thank you. Okay, so I think we have time for one more. Um, so it's more about you. So what's next for you? Um, are you going to continue with this, go back to school? Like, what are you thinking? Yeah, it's a great question, um, as, as always. Um, I think that, you know, this started when I was on my spring break and has gone into my summer break. And so I am taking next semester off from school um, for several reasons. You know, I, I, I don't know how much I would get out of a Zoom-based learning system, to be honest. Um, and so, so I'm taking the semester off because I feel like there is more that I can accomplish. There's more that needs doing right now than I can accomplish by sitting in class learning about p-values or statistics or whatever. Um, and so to me, the reason to, to, to go to college is to learn how to make an impact in the real world. And I feel like to an extent, I've been given this incredible gift and ability to make a real change. And so I am, I'm excited to be able to spend next semester really working to not only turn this organization into one that's sustainable, but serve my community in a way that I think will have real longevity and, and a real world impact. Thank you. So I think we're just about done. Um, so thank you again so much for, for coming on the call and doing this. Um, yeah, thank you. And thank you to everyone who came. Um, yeah, I think that's it. But Thank you so much for having me. This was lovely. Yeah, of course. Okay. Okay. Thank you again. <laughs>